In your 1998 Gifford Lectures, Living in a Secular Age, you sought to identify the various complex and interrelated factors which led to the beginnings of a self-sufficient humanism. What have been the main developments in your field since you wrote your Gifford Lectures, and have these been expected or unexpected? Well, they were hoped for, but they weren't expected. They are really extraordinary developments that have come very fast. You see, I wrote that book really about Western uh, history, Western secularity. And the idea behind that was that the whole world isn't the same. There isn't a single global process. Modernity is coming in different forms in different cultures. And so would be developments analogous to secularism. So I wanted to open that space, but I didn't think it would be filled so quickly. Mm. And what's extraordinary is that people are now writing very interesting stuff about India and the Indian development, very different. The Chinese development, very, very different. The Islamic one. And that is something very, very, you know, very gratifying in a sense. I've been hoping yeah. that this kind of debate would get going. But the scholars, really top scholars, are now being interested in this. And it's opened a number of other gates, too, if I could go on. Yeah. You see, if you try to understand why the situation is so different and, and the Chinese trajectory is so different from the Western one and the Indian one, people feel you have to go back to what we call now the axial age. I know this is a great expression introduced by the German philosopher Karl Jaspers after the war. You know, the age in which he saw that these great changes occurred in ancient civilizations, with the Buddha and, for instance, in Indian civilization, with the beginning of the you know, Hebrew religion as we know it, with the Greeks, with Plato, with Confucius, and so on. And he saw this extraordinary, these are very similar in some ways, but they're also different. And so people have been trying to once more raise this question. What do these big changes have in common? What's different? Do we need to understand that difference to understand what's happening now today? Yes. And I think it's a unanimous view that we do. Yes. So this idea of Jasper is kind of dropped into a hole afterwards <laughs> and nobody talked about it. And then Shmuel Eisenstadt particularly started this going again, I think, in the 80s or 90s, and it's since become a very hot topic with really, really top scholars. So, so the, the big development is, yeah. a, is kind of a new focus on the axial age and, yeah. and the, the kind of commonality as well as the distinctives of the different narratives. Yeah. And your own work kind of opened up a way in which it, the Western narrative could be placed in a global perspective. Yes. Well, I mean, I certainly put the Western narrative in the perspective of the axial change yes. that affected yes. us. I mean, the Greek and the uh, and the Hebrew one. So, in a way, uh, you know, I'm fully yes, <laughs> sort of happy fully behind with that. With this, with this, uh. and then, I mean, in a sense, that opened even further <laughs> horizon because if you begin to think of, well, I mean, this is what what it really depends on. If you think we can't really understand the differences today without going back to the great axial revolutions, right? then do we not have to go even farther back to understand why you know, many centuries, millennia after the human, present human society started, this kind of radical change occurred? What is it about the evolution of religion in general? And uh, what are its features in general? And how does it manage to give rise to this kind of revolutionary change? Mm. And so the issue of the evolution of religion, which, I mean, really runs in common with the issues of the evolution of the human uh, species, the evolution of such a thing as culture, um, and the evolution of religion, all, and the evolution of language, all these things are totally tied together. And there again, some very, very interesting stuff is going on. I might mention particularly a book by somebody I've learned a great deal mm. from over the years, the American sociologist Robert Bella, who's just produced a magnificent book called The uh, Religious Evolution, I think it's called, yes. <laughs> yes, which is looks over this whole sweep from the very beginning right up into um, the, uh, he finishes with the great axial, four great axial revolutions. Re revolutions, uh, yeah. okay. And so what are the, um, the particular distinctives of the Western narrative in light of this new global axial kind of perspective? Yeah. Well, I think that what emerged from all these great axial revolutions was a kind of compromise formation between the pre-axial religion. Pre-axial religions were focused on human flourishing, if you like negotiating or praying with the gods mm -hmm. to 
and the idea that these gods to whom we prayed or sacrificed weren't unreservedly concerned with human flourishing. Some of them were <laughs> kind of hostile and others had to be, you know, Placated. brought onto our side, yes, right, that yeah. sort of thing. Whereas in the post-axial religion, you have this idea of a higher good even greater than, anyway, a human flourishing, certainly greater than our particular local tribal flourishing, something universal. And the highest spiritual reality, be it God or nirvana, was thought to be unreservedly in favor of, of that good, right? So mm -hmm. you had, I mean, another feature of post-axial religion is that it opened a space for individual devotion. You get um, wise, uh, wise men. You get uh, bhikkhus, you know, in, in uh, monks in in Buddhism. <clears throat> you get later on monks in Christianity. You get philosophers, lovers of wisdom, in in Greece, and so you have this stratum of people who are really into a kind of individual. Uh, I mean, not a, the religion was only for them, but they were into a kind of individual mode of life, which was particularly uh, devoted or wise and so on. So these very large civilizations had a great deal of collective ritual, which, which was very much like it had always been for the flourishing of the society, and also had these kind of higher aspirations. And there was always a certain amount of tension, but it sort of held together. I think what happened to Latin Christendom, it's a kind of rogue civilization in a certain <laughs> sense in which this this too comfortable you know, uh, arrangement was upset by yes. powerful movements of reform, which were trying to make this higher set of axial goals the whole thing, right? And get rid of the earlier pre-axial modes, uh, which were now categorized as mere magic or <clears throat> superstition. So it had to be set aside. Yeah. So the distinctive really is is reform. I think what you call reform with a capital R. That's right. That's yeah. Right. So so what's the, what's the nature of, of that? Well, the, the it's the goal here, which was really very striking. The goal was making everybody over into what had previously been the minority type of uh, devotion, and that, that I mean that did two things. First, it destroyed the horizon in which pre-axial religion had always existed, which we call very often the enchanted world, a mm -hmm. world of magic forces, of powers yes. and spirits, yeah. destroyed that. I mean, so that modern Westerners and a lot of modern uh, people outside the West just doesn't say anything to them anymore. Yes. They don't have that sense. That was one very big change. And the other very big change was that it involved a tremendous amount of making ourselves over disciplines of self-control, disciplines of, as we're holding back, delay gratification, uh, keeping our anger under wraps. Uh, this has been well charted by Western historians mm. for a long time, like Norbert uh, Elias and so on, the extraordinary way in which people let themselves go in anger and <clears throat> had a much more, you know, were even kind of more or less promiscuous, I don't mean necessarily sexually, but in the way that mm. they ate together and so on, and the way in which we developed this sense of politeness and uh, one's own privacy and a little bit the sense of being <laughs> a certain nausea at being too close to other people. Well, this kind of makeover, uh, this makeover of discipline, which also increased immensely the power of individuals and societies, you know, made this a very different kind of, kind of civilization, one in which the, our present idea that humans are potential masters of the universe that we can do whatever we want with it yes. comes to be, you know, with all the worries that that now produces. Yes, you know, we're yes. masters of it, but are we yes. wrecking the? You know, yes, wrecking the world. Wrecking yes. the ship, wrecking the, the home. Yes. And that had tremendous social, cultural, and political ramifications yes. as well. And one of the um, distinctives or characteristics of Western political culture is the parliamentary democratic system. Do you believe that the growth of democracy is directly connected to the rise of secularism? It is in our case, yes. But that, <clears throat> so that is one of the really interesting questions. Where, what you have to ask of how much this can be you know, just attributed to everybody. Now, if you look at China today, you would say there's a very powerful makeover going on yes. with, with disciplines and so on, but there's not much sign of, of democracy on the horizon. The jury is out. I mean, some people yeah. think that this kind of modern, industrial, dynamic, constantly self-changing civilization has, in the end, to become democratic. 
I'm not sure, but that's an interesting question. But there's another interesting question. Does the rise of democracy require this kind of spread of these disciplines and um, destruction of the enchanted world? And, and there the answer seems to be no, because you have this extraordinary democracy, India, mm. which is, you know, we have all sorts of problems, of course, who doesn't have <laughs> but, but no, that it's a functioning democracy. It's, it's um, popular democracy. I mean, if you ask Indians today, you know, do you value the democratic system? The majority says yes. But that kind of disenchantment of daily life just hasn't happened. So, so you know, it's the exception. Yeah, it's exception. But I mean, that upsets a lot of our <laughs> <laughs> self-understanding because we look, we think of these things, you know, without the discipline of citizenship and so on and self-control. I mean, how could you have yeah, democracy? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. So we have, we're in for lots of surprises. <clears throat> that makes it interesting, then, yeah. definitely. And, and one of the issues that we confront today particularly is um, developing new legislation for secularized, pluralized yeah. society. And I think this has been a focus of your yeah. own research. What do you think are the challenges, the major challenges presented by this? Well, the challenges here come from uh, democracy. I mean, they come from <clears throat> democracy together with diversity. If uh, democracies occurred in very homogeneous societies, you know, like ancient Greece, there's not a immediate problem. But once you have people very diverse religiously, with the democracy committed in principle to equality of all citizens, then you get a very deep problem. I mean, you can't have, in the end, a state which is committed to one religion, mm. particularly to imposing it. It's just yes. going to be unlivable. And <clears throat> the problem is, for us, that all democracies are uh, diversifying trem tremendously, and it's a big challenge for all of them to develop a form of secularism that's not biased one way or the other. I mean, it doesn't help to go from a religiously controlled one to an anti-religiously controlled one, as for a while in, in uh, Turkey, for instance. That, you know, it's not going to answer the question. So I think there again, uh, I mean, what's really interesting, but at the same time disquieting, is that as societies diversify, the sort of the people who are there <laughs> together become a different population, and you have to rethink some of your previous formulae, legal formulae. And this is something that all Western societies are really having trouble with. I mean, to start off with France, right? yes. <laughs> which is, which is the <clears throat> one of the hallmark societies from this point of view. But now they have to ask themselves, is that 1905 formula enough? So, so, so the challenge has come from, from secularism and the religious marketplace and the kind of what you call the Nova effect or the supernova. Yes, that's right, that's right. Or else you get a society like India, of course, which was religiously diverse from the very beginning, right? So, and there, it, the same kind of issue, but in, you know, gets comes up in a slightly different form. But once again, can you put democracy together with the hegemony of one religious view? Now there is a powerful party in India, the BJP, that wants to mm -hmm. do that. But I think it's not an accident that the BJP has suffered some regression, right, in, yeah. in recent years, because it just can't combine with with a modern democracy. Mm. And, and so with, with globalization as well, that must be um, adding an extra factor to the mix, a complication because of the spread of Western secularism into the non-Western Well, yes, world. and also we're all looking inside each other's societies like a goldfish bowl. So yes. if you get some tremendous conflict, let's say, between a Muslim minority and the majority in a Western country, that repercusses into uh, the relations of the whole West with the whole Muslim world and vice versa, right? So you can't have these problems just ironed out among ourselves, nobody looking, <laughs> nobody, yeah. nobody reacting. In a certain sense, geopolitical forces both complicate and, yeah, and they envenom um, the relations inside the society. Mm. Uh, and moving back to kind of a more um, a personal level, one of the major shifts you traced in your book was from the, the poorest sense of self to the what you call the buffered sense of self. Mm. Do you still believe that this buffered sense of self-identity marks a major divide between the West and non-Western worlds? Not the non-Western world as a whole, but certainly if you go, let's say, to you know, large parts of Africa today, you have something very much like our ancestors. You have very much porous cells. Now, once again, you know, the, and the same in India. So what expectations should we have? Should we think that everyone's going to develop towards uh, what I call the buffered self? 
I wish I could, you know, <laughs> I could say that. I mean, it's something that we would all have said, and people looking at secularization 20 years ago would have said, oh, of course, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, but. <clears throat> Is it uh, even possible there's a kind of unraveling of that secularization and a kind of yearning for a more porous sense of self with mm -hmm. the kind of the rise of ecological consciousness and the, yeah. in the Christian and non-Christian world, the rise of kind of charismatic Pentecostal yeah. religions and New Age spirituality and all of those kind of things that we might be seeing a return to the enchanted world in yes, some ways. In some ways, but that's interesting because it doesn't look, in our case in the West, that it could ever be quite the same. But I think you're onto something very important there. The whole romantic movement in the late 18th century, Germany and UK, but also in France, was really a reaction to a totally disenchanted world and the search for a new kind of enchantment, but it wasn't, you know, if you read Wordsworth, it's not at all like <laughs> looking back to the rights no. of, you know, but the sense that there's something, I think, great going on in nature, the force moving through all of nature, which in some way speaking to us, and yet we're deaf, and so, if you like, our poetry, our music, our painting become ways of making us hear again or see again. <clears throat> that, I think, is very, very powerful theme in Western society. And as you say, it underlies a great deal of the ecological movements today. Uh, the yearning to yeah, the go yearning. back so to people talk, I mean, You're right, people talk about re-enchantment. Uh, <laughs> a lot of books, if you look at the Google that, yeah. you see a lot of books coming out today re -enchantment of about the, the re-enchantment of the world. But it will never be the same enchanted it won't be the world. Same. Yeah. Okay, and another consequence of um, the development of the buffered self is kind of this empowerment, this idea of shaping your identity, mm -hmm. your destiny, as well as the reforming the structures of society. What have been the dynamics of this, and are there any signs of change in a world where people are more aware of ecological disasters and after the Holocaust and so on, a kind of loss of confidence in I wish, I mean, not, we, we don't read a loss of confidence, but I wish there were more questioning about that. The thing is, it's been, we've been through several centuries in which it's been impossible to get off the treadmill because of the societies that acquire this kind of power, which you see in their military power, but also their organizational power and so on, conquered the world. I mean, that was the basis of these huge Western-based empires, empires yeah. right? And now there's a blowback to that. But the people blow back by trying to take on some of the same structures as in order to fight back. So we have this uh, sense that I mean, even today, when it's not so much military, I hope anyway, for a while anymore, yes. but people are thinking economically, right? Everyone is anguishing, uh, you know, the, have we got enough uh, discipline, enough education, enough uh, uh, entrepreneurship, enough to, you know, to compete with the Chinese, or <laughs> the, in this case, the Americans, or in the Americans, Europe, etc. So <clears throat> it's as though we're being driven forward constantly to develop more, make ourselves more apt to compete, etc. It's a very powerful engine. That's why it's, it's what to put the change the metaphor, it's hard to get off the train. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look what's happening now. We, everyone says we need to get to a post-growth society, people say with one side of their heads. And then faced with the, I think, rather imprudent austerity policies of this country and certain other countries, people say, no, 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 we have to go slower, we have to have some growth, because without that growth, we have incredible suffering, unemployment, and, and so on. So. With one side of our heads, we're saying, maybe we should look to a post-growth society. With the other side of our heads, we're saying, no growth, no, no, no. Yes. <laughs> we have to bring it back. See? And, <clears throat> and uh, there's very, very powerful forces that are propelling us forward, competitive forces. And, and so there's a sense that we don't quite know where we're going. We're, just, we're being driven, but we don't quite know by what. Yes. I mean, the only recourse has got to be these large international agreements like Kyoto was supposed to be, but these are very fragile and some powers just aren't playing the game. I must say in this regard, looking at Europe from the outside, you are, you're in the lead as far as this is concerned, but <clears throat> America, Canada under its present terrible government, uh, China, India, no. So <clears throat> the, the mechanisms we might be able to use to change direction are, are failing us. Mm. So, so what do you think over the next 20 years, what kind of developments might we see? If you were, and if you were to give your Gifford lectures again in 20 years' time, what would you need to address, do you think? 
Well, I think, I mean, I would have to start totally yeah. afresh because I, but that's a positive thing because I think the scholarship that I was mentioning earlier will have gone so far in 20 years time that whoever wanted to do something like I, I, I undertook would have to start from a totally different place. But that's a happy development. As far as the policies are concerned in 20 years' time, oh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope we've made a radical turn. Thank you very much, for Professor Taylor, for offering us a, a global and deep view of the origins of our culture and society. Okay, thank you. <laughs>